thanks for coming. Um, and especially, I noticed that there's a lot of law students here tonight, which is really great. I'm always really jazzed when the law students come all the way up the hill for us. So um, thanks especially to the law students for coming, but to everybody else too. Uh, my name is Josh Galpern, and I run the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Bill Hohenstein tonight. So uh, Bill is our, well, actually, I should say, I'm probably not the, the best person to introduce Bill because we'd never met before today, and we'd only communicated by email. And in the midst of our email communications, there was a government shutdown that some of you may have heard about. So for a few, few days there, we couldn't even communicate by email. Um, fif 15 days, yeah. So, um, <coughs> so I don't know everything there is to know about Bill, but I, I'm really excited to have him here because as, as many of you guys realize, obviously climate change is a huge issue and food and agriculture issues are really important uh, across the globe and especially on campus right now. It's something that people are really talking about and, and Bill brings both of those two things together. So I've been telling people, and we're gonna have Bill here uh, to talk about this and everybody who I've told, almost everybody who I've told has said, oh, that's so great, we, we know what Bill does, we know about the work that his office does, and uh, we're really excited to, to come see him. And it turns out that that's actually true, so I'm really, really glad to hear that. Um, <coughs> so uh, just to say a little bit about uh, Bill's background, thing one that you should know is that Bill has a master's in environmental management. He is one of the few people you will meet, partic particularly here, who has a, an MEM that isn't from Yale. He's got one from uh, the Nicholas School. Uh, uh, is, should I add something to that? <laughs> uh, he's got one from Duke. <clears throat> so you've got only a couple places you can get these, and we happen to have someone who didn't get one here. Um, the other thing that you need to know, this is the important thing, is that Bill is the director of the USDA Climate Change Program Office. And in that capacity, what he does is uh, run a, a team of people, I presume it's a team, who, uh, <coughs> who look at the impacts that climate change is having on, on agriculture in this country. And obviously, that's a really broad range of issues and a really broad range of, I mean, agriculture at the USDA doesn't just mean, you know, wheat and corn. It means fruit and it means forestry and it means uh, a, a lot of other things. So it's a big job and hopefully we'll get to hear uh, more than a little bit about what that entails tonight. So without further ado, Bill, thank you very much for joining us. Stuff. And does this work? Yep. Great. Yeah, and it's a pleasure to be up at uh, up to Yale. This is actually my first trip to Yale um, as a and as a as a Duke graduate. Th that other uh, master's program uh, in in forestry and environmental studies. And back when I went to Duke, it actually had a different name. Now it is the Nicholas School of the Environment. Um, when I went there, it was the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And somewhere along the line, the Forestry got lost from the, the title of Duke. So it's really nice to be here at a forestry school that still is proud of, of being a forestry school. Um, as Josh mentioned, I'm the director of USDA's uh, Climate Change Program Office. I'm also serving as the acting director right now for a new office called the Office of Environmental Markets, dealing with um, market-based solutions to environmental problems involving agriculture. But I want to talk primarily tonight about the challenge that we face from climate change. Um, and it's, and it's going to be a pretty basic talk, but I'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions. It looks like we have a pretty good audience. I was thinking there were going to be more law students, so some of this is going to be a little bit of climate change 101 with um, implications for food security, a little bit about what we do at USDA to position agriculture to deal with these emerging challenges. Um, but again, I'm going to try to leave plenty of time for questions where we can go into things like biofuels or the farm bill or the ongoing climate negotiations or whatever you want to talk about as a broad range of issues that we get involved with at, at USDA. So let me start at the beginning just to get and, and to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, as the director of the climate change office at USDA, I spent a lot of time going out and talking to farmers and farm groups and farm organizations all across the country. And one of the first things we, we need to talk about is, is the climate changing and are humans causing it? So this question of both detection and attribution. And I would try to build the case for this because it's really important that farmers understand sort of what's happening with the climate system, what's driving it, and what the consequences are for them. And, it, and sometimes it's a difficult conversation to have because, you know, farmers can be an or, ornery bunch and they have a variety of views with regard to, you know, things like climate change. And so we start 
you know, with, with the basics, you know, the theory, and, and trying to address a whole series of questions, theory. Do greenhouse gases influence the climate system? If so, how? Are the concentrations of these gases changing? And can the changes in the concentrations we're seeing be tied to human activity? As a consequence, are we seeing climate change? Are temperatures changing? And are these patterns consistent with what we might expect, given our understanding of the climate system? And then, is it making any difference on the ground? And so I try to go through these questions and really build sort of the, the case that, yes, in fact, um, humans are having an impact on the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases turn out to influence the climate system, and the climate system is changing. So we start with the, this is the, the high school science 101 graph, which is, you know, we start with the sun and the earth. Um, you know, obviously, we have a greenhouse effect. Um, the gases in the atmosphere trap a certain amount of, of radiation from the sun that, that gets um, not reflected, but, but um, re-radiated in, into the atmosphere in the form of infrared radiation. Greenhouse gases themselves turn out to absorb uh, a portion of that energy and radiate it back in all directions. And so some of the radiation that gets absorbed by the greenhouse gases ends up going back into space, but some of it gets um, radiated back down to the Earth's surface, which is important because without a greenhouse effect, we'd have a, a, an atmosphere or a climate system similar to Mars rather than what we have uh, uh, here on Earth. So there is a greenhouse effect. It's driven by the range of greenhouse gases, and it's sort of critical to having a habitable planet. Um, now, from a human perspective, what gases are most important? Well, the ones that are really driving the changes are, are sort of three greenhouse gases, CO2, nitrous oxide, and methane, along with a set of synthetic gases that are substitutes for CO2. In addition, there are a number of gases that we're putting into the atmosphere that are countering some of this. And in fact, some of these are pollutants, things like aerosols, SO2, um, and, uh, and, and things that r relate to tropospheric ozone. Um, and then finally, there are n natural forces as well that, that influence the climate system periodically. Um, are these concentrations increasing in the atmosphere? And this is sort of the granddaddy of all climate um, graphs. This is the, the graph of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere as measured at the top of the Mauna Loa volcano in, in Hawaii. Now, why they went to Hawaii um, and went to the top of a volcano to measure CO2? In part because CO2 is a well-mixed gas in the atmosphere, but it's not perfectly well-mixed. And in fact, if you take the CO2 concentration around a, a city like Baltimore or Washington, D.C., you're going to get a much higher concentration than if you try to select a spot that's out in the middle of nowhere, like in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And so this is a very good indicator of what we background um, levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. And what you notice about this slide is two things. One, it's going up, and it's continuing to go up, so CO2 concentrations are increasing. The second thing that's really interesting from a land perspective is that this is not a straight line. It, in fact, it looks like a sawtooth. And that is, this is the power of terrestrial systems, forests in particular. A big shout out to all the forestry majors out there. Um, the, the, the differences in CO2 concentrations are driven by the, the, the seasons in the northern hemisphere. There's much more land in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. And as plants and trees grow and, and leaf out, they absorb carbon, and during the fall and winter, when the leaves fall off the trees and they decompose and we get, uh, we get more um, uh, uh, respiration than photosynthesis, we see a, a, a increases in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. So not only can you see CO2 concentrations increasing, you can see the effect of terrestrial systems on the, on the CO2 balance in the atmosphere. So we know greenhouse gases have a radiative effect. We know that the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are increasing. Is it making any difference? Well, yeah, we're seeing cl the climate change as well. And in fact, um, you know, that change is actually accelerating. We're seeing uh, 
greater rates of warming um, over the last four decades, especially over the last decade in the U.S. and globally as well. Um, now, temperature turns out to be one of the most variable elements of the climate system, and it's difficult to actually detect these changes. And so we don't just look at, at surface temperature to see whether the climate is changing. We look at a number of important variables some, or, or, or uh, uh, observations, some of which are much more stable, like glaciers, sea ice, ocean temperatures. You know, these, these indicators are, are much more stable, and they're, in fact, if we look at the major ones across the globe, sea surface temperature, um, ocean heat content, sea level, um, air temperature, snow cover, all of these indicators, both within the U.S. and globally, are heading in the direction that we'd expect with human-induced climate change. Um, so and this is what it looks like. If you go back over the last thousand years, um, and in fact, if you go past thousand years, you know, think about um, the entire period where humans have developed their agricultural systems. We've existed in this very narrow band of climate system globally. We've had variations. We've certainly had warm periods. We've had cooling periods. But we are now at a point in the late part of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century where we're getting outside of this range of what we've seen, not just going back 100 years or 200 years, but going back over 1,000 years. Um, and these changes, both in terms of extent and pattern, are entirely consistent with the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, and the rate of buildup is increasing. And so while we're here, this is what we expect over the next century with, um, on the low end, somewhere about a two degree C, which is really four degrees Fahrenheit of warming, to upwards of four to seven degrees of warming over the next century centigrade, so or Celsius. And um, you know, this is my Al Gore slide, and it's, it's meant to alarm a little bit. It's, um, it's quite alarming to me, but we're going to be well outside of historic ranges by the middle of next century. And so you, you can see the extent of warming is, is pretty significant. And in fact, the, 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 and there's also uncertainty. Um, what's alarming to me somewhat is that we, we are tending to be on the high side. So both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, we're sort of on the high end of what we'd expect in terms of the rate of, of buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And then in terms of the responsiveness of the climate system to these buildups, both of those are turning out to be more on the high side than the low side. And so if anything, you know, the, this, the projections that are showing greater amounts of warming, it seems to be some of the, with, through some of the early evidence that that's the track that we're on. Um, so what's evidence for agriculture is that we are going to see a significant amount of warming. Um, what's also important, two other factors that don't jump out at you from this graph is the pace of warming the, is going to accelerate. And so right now where we're seeing about 0.2 degrees C of changing per decade, um, by the middle of next century we could be seeing 0.6 degrees of change per decade, and by the end, 0.8 degrees uh, per decade. And so for what that means if you're a farmer, while you may be able to adapt to the changes you're seeing right now, um, your ability to adapt in the future is going to be very much compromised as, the, as, as climate change accelerates over the next century. Um, and the third thing that doesn't jump out at you immediately is that we do see a lot of climate variability in the record. And what we expect with climate change is not only warming, uh, an accelerated pace of warming, but increases in climate variability, like what we saw in 2012 with the drought. And again, when, it, when you think about agriculture, um, the increases in climate variability may be as important as the absolute rates of change. And so what do we mean by that? Well, um, so this takes that last graph and kind of puts it into a term that I think most people understand. And this is the number of days that are over 100 degrees. And granted, we're up in Connecticut, so maybe not so much an issue from here, but anyone from Texas? Oklahoma, Arizona. Um, so you're used to having some experience with days that are over 100 degrees. Um, currently, you know, uh, 
we see maybe 10 to 15 days a year where you get those kinds of temperatures. Um, under the low emissions, low climate sensitivity scenario, here's what you see. You see some regions of the country with 50 to 75 days a year where we hit over 100 degrees. Under the higher emissions, higher climate sensitivity scenarios, we can see significant chunks of the country where you're seeing, you know, 60, 70, over 100 days of uh, where we're hitting over 100 degrees in a given year. And, you know, that, you know, in, in some ways that's a, you know, that can be a miserable uh, future. Um, in, a, in addition to these kinds of changes, you can think about the entire spectrum of climate variability shifting over to the left, right for you, um, this way. Um, and you can also see in this projection that in addition to having a shift in temperatures, the shape of the curve is actually broadening, so we're seeing greater levels of climate variability as well. Now, a final way to look at this is something that I, you know, I think makes sense to people when you think about records. You know, people tend to remember um, the warmest day or the coldest day of within a season or within a month. Um, and historically, you know, they've tended to balance out. Um, if you look at the 50s and 60s up through the 70s, we've averaged about one to one generally if you look over many decades. And so we get about as many hot records as cold records uh, within, the, within the U.S., within the climate records. Now, when you get out to 1990, we were then seeing uh, 1.36 times as many warm days as warm records as cold records. So for every cold record, we'd have 1.36 warm records. By 2000, it was a two to one ratio. So we had twice as many warm records being broken as cold records. And over the last three years, that's accelerating as well, where in 2012, which was the warmest year on record in the US by a full degree, um, we had four times as many um, heat records being broken as cold records. Now, what, what does this mean for food security? And, and agriculture, I work for, for USDA, agriculture is a critical part of food security, but food security is broader than just growing crops. And in fact, the way FAO defines it, it's there's sort of four elements of food security. Availability, which is what USDA traditionally has been involved in, the production of crops, the production of food, the quantity of food. Um, access, can you get to the food? Can the food get to you? Um, are the transportation distribution systems in place? Utilization, is the food that you expect there or the kinds of crops that you, that you rely on uh, available? And can you use them? Are they adequate for your diet? Um, and then finally, stability, is the, is it in, is, is the food available across seasons, across years? All four of these elements of food security are really critical, and, and failures in any one of them can cause food instability. Um, and what we're finding is all four elements of food security are affected by climate change. So we, it, climate change can affect crop production. It can affect um, food distribution systems. We found that out in the 2012 drought where it became difficult to transport um, uh, uh, grains on the barges along the Mississippi. It can change utilization where crops are going to be changing where they're likely to be grown and how they're likely to be grown. And then stability as well. With increases in climate variability, we're going to see increases in the extent and the, and the frequency of things like severe drought, which will affect the stability of the food system. So this next graph may take a moment to load, but it's, and it may take more than a moment to actually view, but it's kind of significant. Does anyone know what the Palmer Drought Severity Index is, the PDSI? Has anybody heard of this? Anybody? All from the law school. <laughs> um, well, the PDSI, is a, it's an index, it's a, and it's a measure of, of really the amount of, of moisture in the soil or, 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 or a measure of both drought and wetness, and with zero being normal conditions. And so zero in this graph looks like this. 
And you can see that we've experienced across the globe in any given year, as we're kind of circling through the last century, periods of drought and periods where things have been wet around the world. And, you, and I want you to focus specifically on some of the major crop growing regions, the Corn Belt of the U.S., parts of Brazil, parts of Russia, and, and Australia. And you can see that over the last century, we've experienced drought, we've experienced periods of wetness, um, but primarily that range has been sort of in this minus three to plus three. We've had severe droughts that have occurred in the minus four to minus five range, but they've been infrequent um, and as well uh, periods of extreme wetness. Um, but these, these colors on the map do have consequences for people. And in fact, if you look at 2010, and this is a slightly different color scheme, this green is really the blue that we saw in the last graph. Um, this is uh, Central Asia, including Russia and up through, this is Pakistan. And what you can see in this graph is the effects in 2010 of, of one, whoops, whoa, whoa, hold on, there we go. One of the most severe droughts in the Russian wheat belt in 2010, where 20% of the crop was destroyed and much of it was burned, where temperatures were over 12 degrees Fahrenheit higher than normal. Um, and uh, it affected uh, over 20% of their uh, production. At the same time that was happening in Pakistan, we were seeing some of the worst flooding in several generations where 1.6 million acres of cropland was underwater. Um, 1,600 people died, over 10,000 cattle were lost, uh, and you had scenes like this. And so when, when we're thinking about climate variability and the effects of what we're seeing in drought and, and extreme uh, flooding conditions, it has Im Im real implications for people. And they're, you know, underneath this map are, are, are you know, people's lives. So looking into the future, this is what we expect. And this is, you are, I think, one of the, fir the first group to actually see this slide. This is work that we're doing for an upcoming report on climate change and food security that is going to be issued in 2015. Um, this is work we're doing with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and this is their first set of projections of changes in climate variability using the Palmer Drought Severity Index over the next century for one of their mid-range scenarios. So this is a four degrees warming. You know, and, uh, in the earlier slide, I said the range is probably from two to seven. So it's not the highest, but it's not the lowest either. And what you can see over the next century is we see greater periods of drought and more severe drought. And when we see periods of extreme wetness, we see higher extremes over larger areas. Um, and we're also seeing across the globe periods where these droughts tend to be um, correlated. So you'll see periods where there's drought in the, in the U.S. and in Russia and in Brazil all at the same time. So um, while we're in the early stages of analyzing this data, um, what we're trying to get from this is information on how much climate change will affect uh, the probability of drought within a region in any given year or any given period and how likely we're, we are to see correlations in where we see drought across the globe. So again, this is very early work. Um, it's very interesting to see. It's a little alarming, but um, quite important because again, um, most of the work that we've done to date where we've looked at the impacts of climate change on agriculture have focused on the median effects, two degrees warming, four degrees warming. Um, and the economists joke, well, I don't know if it's a great joke, but they talk about a well-behaved climate change. And what they can model using the economic models is well-behaved climate change where it's predictable, where we know what the range of future temperatures are going to be, where we don't see wild swings in changes in extreme events. And what we're seeing with some of the latest regional modeling is not only do we have to worry about the climate change itself, but we also have to worry about increased variability and increased drought. So is all lost? Well, let me see if I can keep going, provide some hope. Um, 
Farmers are inherently adaptable. They, they are an amazing group. And in fact, um, again, looking back at the 2012 drought, um, we can see how farmers fared and, and in many ways how they were resilient to the changes they're seeing. Now, what we're seeing today with their response to climate change is what I would call reactive adaptation. They're responding to what they're seeing on the ground. It's not proactive adaptation where they're planning ahead and incorporating information about what we expect in the future with regard to changes in the climate system. But even with that, they're responding to what they're seeing on the ground. We're seeing changes in where crops are being grown. We're seeing corn being grown in North Dakota. Um, we're, we're seeing changes in the way crops are grown. Up through 2011, the biggest problem that we had in the Midwest was through the decade, our springs were very wet. We had very short planting windows. And in response, farmers purchased bigger equipment and were able to get in and out of the fields in a very short amount of time to take advantage of the time when they could actually work the fields in the spring. Um, that wasn't the case in 2012. Um, but what we found in 2012 was that farmers that had employed st strong conservation practices, water conservation practices, and practices that enhanced the soil, that built soil carbon, that built soil organic matter, were able to withstand much of what the 2012 drought threw at them. Not every farmer, not in every region, but farmers that had strong conservation practices did better. Um, the farmer safety net turned out to be quite important in 2012. The fact that we had crop insurance for many farmers enabled them to survive the drought, maybe not in terms of producing crops, but in terms of being able to provide a crop uh, in 2013. Um, and so, and, and farmers um, used information, information that we were providing through things like our drought monitor, our, our drought projections, were quite valuable to farmers and they utilized that in making decisions about um, their operations. And then finally, what we found in 2012, compared to previous droughts, is that the, the quality of our crop, the, the genetic improvements that we've made to corn and soybeans and the commodity crops, has made the plants stronger and more, more rigorous and better able to withstand drought. And so if you compare um, national levels of production last year to say that 1988 drought or the 1956 drought, farmers fared much better. In fact, as bad as uh, 2012 was, it was the seventh largest corn crop on record and the eighth largest soybean crop on record. And so we were able to continue to produce a crop. We did have pretty significant losses in both of those commodities last year, but it wasn't as severe as you might expect. And part of that was due to the fact that we've, we've done a, a tremendous amount of work to improve the quality of the corn and, and soybean crop. Now that's not the same in developing countries. And while developing country farmers are adaptable, uh, uh, adaptable as well, their access to technology, their access to information, their access to resources to help them invest in the kinds of practices that are gonna uh, make them more resilient to change, all of that is, is less. And as a consequence, when we see you know, increases in climate variability like we saw in those projections, they're going to be much more severe for developing countries. And so while we don't necessarily have the plan for how the world's going to adapt to climate change, we do know what the tools are going to be and we know what's going to be important. Certainly continued research and technology development, building stronger crops, stronger uh, 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 drought tolerance in our uh, crops is going to be important. Improved water management technologies, drip irrigation. Um, conservation practices are going to be extremely important. Building up organic matter in the soil, conserving the water that we have. Improving access by farmers uh, uh, to the latest information. So building from our existing drought monitor to do a better job of short-term drought forecasts. Um, internationally, we have a program called FuseNet, which is the famine uh, early warning system that operates both in Africa and in Central America, and that those networks help provide farmers and relief agencies with information about what to expect with drought and what, what that will Im imply with regard to food security actions in those regions. Um, development and wealth is really critical to this. When you think about climate change occurring over the next century, how economies uh, evolve and um, 
you know, the, the more resources society has to deal with things like climate change, the more adaptable they're going to be. So farmers in the U.S. with more resources to invest in technologies are going to be better positioned than farmers in other regions of the world where they might not have that. But as we see over the next century, um, we're already seeing actually in places like Brazil and Argentina and South Africa where farming systems are changing very rapidly and looking much more similar to what we see in the U.S. Um, those systems are also going to be more adaptable as well. And then finally, building, focusing not just on food production, but all the elements of food security. Um, looking at food distribution systems, um, trying to reduce waste. Still, um, when we think about food demand over the next century, um, if we can reduce waste, um, if we can uh, uh, improve uh, uh, commodity utilization, um, it's almost as if we can improve production. So let me come back to the U.S. And, and look at specifically how we expect climate change to affect agricultural systems. Starting in the Northeast, um, you know, we do expect to see higher temperatures, but in some cases that's going to mean longer growing season. Um, farmers in the Northeast, we expect to have maybe a, a wider variety of crops that are going to be uh, able to be grown, although some crops that currently rely on chilling, like the apple crop, could be adversely affected. Um, we will ex see changes in extreme events. Um, primarily of concern for the Northeast is uh, extreme precipitation events um, and coastal flooding. Um, in the Midwest, we also expect to see more rainfall falling in extreme events versus uh, what we've seen historically. Here, the increases in heat events where we get days and especially nighttime temperatures of that are that are high are, are going to affect the quality and the and production of our crops. Um, we've already seen growing seasons lengthen by over two weeks since 1950, but at the same time we've seen wetter springs and fewer fewer workable field days, and, and we expect that to continue for most years, with maybe some increases in these severe droughts that we've seen as well. Uh, in the southeast, um, drought is certainly going to be an issue. Water availability is going to be an issue. Here you're going to see temperature drive um, many of the effects that we see in agricultural systems and not in a good way. Um, and um, an expansion of, of pests and diseases that we don't typically see in the U.S. Um, in the northern plains, um, water is certainly going to be a great concern. Um, but like the Midwest, you're going to see longer growing season and some additional opportunities to grow uh, uh, a wider variety of crops, but um, that's going to be dependent on whether water is available. The Southern Plains and Southwest together um, are s the regions of the country that are going to be most adversely affected by climate change. Um, they get the sort of this double whammy of, of higher temperatures where they don't really need higher temperatures with reduced um, water availability, more drought, less precipitation, and importantly for both of these regions, um, a reduction in snowpack. Um, the winter snowpack in the southwest in particular is really critical to agriculture because it's where water is stored for the season. And what we see with climate change is more precipitation falling as rain and less as snow. And so it runs off immediately and it's not and is, isn't stored. And that's going to have implications for agriculture. Um, we also see that in the Pacific Northwest um, where they have some of the same issues with the Northeast of specialty crops being adversely affected. Um, so what's USDA doing about this? Well, one of the things that we announced, or our secretary just announced in June, was we are going to take a regional approach to how we support farmers and how we integrate climate change into virtually all of our programs and activities and services. And we're going to do that through an, the establishment of seven regional climate change hubs, one for each of the regions that, that you just saw. Um, the mission is going to be to position agriculture for the challenges that we expect to face over the next century. Um, initially, we think these hubs will have three main functions. One is analytic. Um, each hub is going to be asked to do uh, a climate risk assessment, a risk and vulnerability assessment, and also serve as the repository within that region for climate forecasts and projections. 
Um, a significant responsibility of these hubs will be to evaluate and assess um, new technologies and practices that can help farmers become more resilient to climate change um, and to provide that sort of technical support for our programs, our outreach and extension programs, our conservation programs. And then finally, education and outreach. Uh, we, we're very interested in working with extension, working with the universities. We think about the land-grant universities, but the private universities as well that have an important role to play in working directly with stakeholders and in, in building resilience to the challenges that we're going to be facing. And then providing information directly to the public as well. Um, internationally, USDA has important responsibilities and we're working with our partners both um, in non-governmental organizations, groups like the World Bank, the FAO, uh, the OECD, and other governments. Um, we're very excited about launching a new initiative on what we're calling Climate Smart Agriculture, which is an effort that we're doing jointly with the governments of the Netherlands and South Africa. This program will have three goals, um, enhancing sustainable production, adapting to climate change, and mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, all simultaneously through the same program. Um, we work on a variety of programs with the World Bank to uh, address tropical deforestation, um, and we're hoping to take some of what we're learning through our domestic climate hubs and apply that internationally as well. And so I realize I covered a lot of ground. There's a lot of things that I didn't talk about, and I mentioned this right at the beginning of our talk. We could talk about things like the Farm Bill or biofuels or the ongoing, maybe never-ending international climate negotiations. Um, why don't I stop here? I think we've got maybe 20 minutes or so for questions. Um, and we can throw out topics and I can address them. So everybody, we've got um, two folks here who are going to run the mics to you. So if you've got questions, just raise your hands and, uh, and uh, we'll bring your mic. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I was just at the beginning. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned the um, market solutions program that you were starting. Can you maybe just talk about, you know, what you're doing and what examples? And sure, sure. This Office of Environmental Markets, uh, and and this program, this office was set up to help um, establish uh, emerging environmental markets. Now, what's an environmental market? It's basically where um, there's demand for an environmental good or service, something like carbon sequestration or uh, improvements in water quality, reductions in nitrogen, phosphorus from waterways, um, wetland habitat, uh, 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 wildlife habitat, um, endangered species habitat. So this office basically has three tasks. One is to define the metrics for what defines an environmental good or service, and so how you quantify tons of carbon or tons of methane reduced or pounds of nitrogen avoided from a stream. Um, it has a role in working with the regulatory agencies. These environmental markets don't operate in a vacuum, or sometimes they operate voluntarily, but more often they, uh, they work in concert with environmental regulations. And so there's a, there's a regulated entity, whether it be a, a water treatment plant or a utility that is looking for environmental improvements and can partner with farmers in producing those environmental improvements. And so. We work with the regulatory agencies to, to incorporate this market-based flexibility into their programs. And then finally, um, we help with uh, established guidelines for verification systems so, so that um, if this environmental good or services is, is produced, folks have confidence that it's real and that it's, um, it's going to continue. Um, it's a small office. It's been around for now three years in the Office of the Chief Economist. <coughs> We focused a lot of our efforts <coughs> right now on the first, the first task, um, developing water quality standards and developing um, greenhouse gas standards for agriculture. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, you mentioned the shifts in uh, corn production in the Northern Plains, and that made me wonder about a couple of things related to that um, topic. 
Uh, first, how, how you see the shifts in crops proceeding with climate change, particularly in the northern plains, um, will there, and how do you think that will impact trade? So I'm thinking of more corn being produced in the northern plains means less wheat being produced. How does that impact our national food supply? How does it impact our trade with Canada or other northern countries? And then same question for our trade with southern American countries that might be producing corn that yeah, that's a good question. Might be competing with their markets. Yeah, um, nationally, um, corn production has expanded pretty dramatically in the last five years. We've gone from about 70 million acres of, of corn production to over 90 million acres of corn production, and some of that is an expansion of corn northward, northward, um, and it's been driven by a variety of, of factors. Climate is one, so longer growing season certainly has played a role. Um, the availability of short season corn, corn that matures in say 75 days versus 90 days, um, that's, that's played a role. And then price has also played a role. The fact that we've had very strong uh, markets for corn, in part driven by ethanol, um, that's also played a role in the expansion of corn. Um, so it's been sort of, a, you, know, you know, it's hard to pin down exactly what any of the effect of any one of those single factors is, but price certainly is playing a role. In, and climate is playing a role, and changes in technology are also playing a role. Um, that is having an effect on, on wheat. Wheat um, is a very flexible crop and can be grown in many regions of the world. And so um, while there were, um, th it did affect wheat prices, what you've seen is that the markets have responded. So um, as, as U.S. production of wheat has shifted, there are places where, where that can be picked up. Um, in the longer term, when we think about climate change driving commodity production northward, um, most of the long-term modeling shows that, but there are limits to that as well because some of the regions that come into play from agricultural production in parts of Canada um, look ideal from a climate perspective for growing commodities, but the soils really aren't there. So, y you know, the, it, um, from a climate perspective, you know, we could keep marching north, but if you don't have the soil to grow the crops, like in many of the regions in northern Canada, um, you know, there are going to be limits. Um, yeah, just wondering what's, <coughs> what's happening with uh, crop insurance, and do you see any particular trade uh, trends right now going on? with a changing climate. Yeah, and again, 2012 is a good example of that. Um, we've certainly seen a, a, an expansion of the crop insurance program to cover more crops and more farmers um, over the last decade, and that trend is expected to continue. Um, the crop insurance program is responsive to climate change. Um, as we see losses and as we see claims within the crop insurance program, they weigh the more recent data more heavily in terms of how they set premiums. And so if we see a series of losses within a county for a certain crop, um, it's going to make those premiums more expensive and farmers are going to react to that. Um, and so we get a lot of questions about, you know, does the crop insurance program create a buffer where farmers won't react um, to the changes we're seeing? But there are elements that are built into the program that make it responsive to, to climate change. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's really great that you're setting up hubs for information and, uh, information and training programs uh, to kind of create more resilience f in management practices and, uh, and, and farmers. I was wondering, are there any efforts uh, behind the scenes to modify the agricultural economics, the subsidies, different types of market tweaks to try and introduce new crops that might have we have? Yeah, I think certainly um, expanding market opportunities is a priority for the Secretary. You know, it's one of the things he talks about all the time. And it's his you know, one of his interests is in biofuels and bioenergy is that it will expand markets f it, and it will expand opportunities to farmers f to grow new crops within these regions. So, um, you know, what we see with climate change is that. Um, dry season 
crops, things that you could grow for bioenergy like switchgrass or um, sorghum, um, you know, could be viable for farmers. Um, you know, with regard to um, the discussions within the farm bill and how they're whether they're accounting for climate change or not, I don't see a lot of that happening. Um, uh, agriculture is a very adaptable system, and so while we're seeing some shifts already to the changes we're seeing, um, much of our effort with regard to climate change is to, is to position agriculture 20, 30, 40 years out so we're prepared for these longer term challenges where we see greater rates of warming and change. Hi, I'm curious about efforts related to shifting fixed infrastructure around agriculture. Um, yeah. Because if you're looking at like a lot of the dairy in the Northeast um, or even like the fruit um, producers, yep. those are kind of longer term um, uh, investments with that are difficult to move. Yep, and here there, there aren't easy answers and the, the need for improved information and the importance of, of planning ahead are really critical. So, you know, for any sort of capital investment that a farmer is going to make, whether it be in a new orchard or um, a new barn, um, they need to be thinking about what the future climate system is going to look like. Um, we see a lot more advanced planning right now in the forest sector, where um, certainly forest products companies, but also um, state foresters and folks within the national forest system are integrating climate change into planning decisions. And in part, that's because the decisions that they're making on the ground today are still going to be, in many cases, in place 30, 40, 50, 60 years from now, where for farmers, many of their operational decisions last a season or at most a few seasons. Um, and while farms can be highly adaptable to climate change, um, there are going to be certain decisions they make about capital investments, whether it be around water or barns or, or perennial crops, where they really need to be thinking about what the future is going to look like. Um, thank you for your, your lecture. Um, I imagine this might be a bit hard to give to audiences such as farmers, and I'm just curious what their reaction <laughs> is and if you see any sort of um, change happening amongst that group of people. Yeah, um, you know, my sense is farmers actually, they reflect the population broadly. Um, you know, if I, as I, when I give presentations to farmers, I get farmers that stand up and say, of course the climate's changing. Just look at our farm. Look at what my father farmed. Look at the way my grandfather farmed. You know, we're certainly seeing changes. And then you'll get other farmers that say, ah, you know, these are just cycles. We've had cycles in the past. We're going to have cycles in the future. And so in many ways, the perceptions that farmers have about climate change are shaped by what they hear in the public debate. And they reflect sort of the, the, the variety of views that are out there in the public. Um, what I tried to um, get them to in terms of a point is that it's a risk. You know, there's a consensus within the scientific community that this is happening. And while they can believe it or not believe it, they should at least weigh it as an important risk that they should be managing for. And, and farms are very good at managing risk. They deal with, you know, economic risks, they deal with physical risks, they deal with weather risks all the time. And so talking about, to, about um, climate change to farmers in terms of risk management is pretty effective. And the other thing that we find that's effective is that when we talk about what USDA is actually doing about climate change, investing in drought tolerant seed or improved water management systems or improving our drought forecasts and projections, there's a pretty strong consensus within the farm community that these are good things and these are the kinds of things that they want to see USDA investing in. Hi. What is and maybe be doing to mitigate elves, both Yeah, no. Um, 
globally, agriculture is an important contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. About 13% of emissions, 13 to 15%, come directly from agricultural operations. Um, globally, agriculture is also contributes to deforestation, which is about another 15% of emissions. And so you think about the land sector globally, about 30% of the problem comes from the land sector in one form or another. And so it's really important to tackle those sources of emissions and take advantage of opportunities to sequester carbon. Um, I don't think, I, I haven't seen studies directly of the role that transportation of commodities plays in emissions. I mean, certainly the large sources are uh, animal production, livestock production, um, the use of fertilizers, um, and, and on-farm energy use. Um, and so we have programs pretty much across the board to improve efficiencies in all of those areas. Um, one of the things that we find is that one of the best ways to reduce emissions is to improve efficiency. And so if you can increase production, you can reduce emissions per unit of output. Um, and that's really important, especially in the livestock sector, where some of the best opportunities to reduce emissions are actually to enhance production. A lot of people have talked about the carbon benefits and climate benefits of improved agricultural policies. And so I'm curious what progress has been made towards incorporating the U.S. ag sector into carbon markets? Uh, that's been, um, you know, it's, it's <laughs> something I've worked on extensively. I mean, there certainly are cost-effective mitigation opportunities in agriculture. And so if you just look at it in terms of, of an efficiency standpoint, um, there are reductions that you can get by enhancing soil carbon, planting trees in certain areas, reducing nitrous oxide emissions that are very competitive with other options for reducing emissions from the energy sector. Um, the challenge is how do you actually um, connect those and, and create markets? And we have not, at a national level, come to any sort of consensus on that. There were, you know, there were, it's happened in fits and starts. You know, initially the Kyoto Protocol was a market based approach to deal with, with climate change. Um, the latest attempt was through, you know, the legislation that was debated in 2010 with Waxman, Markey, and um, McCain, Lieberman, and um, both, both, you know, those pieces of legislation had, um, had market approaches and offset approaches for agriculture, where agricultural markets could have developed. Um, we're continuing within USDA to lay the groundwork for what could support a market program. We're developing sort of the, tech, the technical standards for how you quantify units of reduction from agricultural technologies. And so, you know, within a state or within a county, if you plant trees at a certain density, you can quantify how much carbon you can expect to sequester. Or if you reduce nitrous oxide, or nitrogen applications, we can quantify how much nitrous oxide you're expected to save. That's just a piece of it. Um, you sort of need the legislative or the market underpinning. Um, that's being led right now at the state level with, you know, the state of California pushing a market approach. Within the Northeast, there's the Reggie system. Um, and, you know, while I'm not an expert on this, the Clean Air Act, which is the vehicle right now that's the primary vehicle for addressing greenhouse gases at a federal level, there may be some opportunities to to incorporate market approaches into it, but it's going to be complex and it's going to take time to work through. Um, right now, we're focused on our programs, trying to incorporate these technologies and practices that have benefits into our conservation programs. And so when we work with farmers through programs like EQIP or the Conservation Reserve Program or the Conservation Security Program, we're um, making these greenhouse gas mitigation technologies priorities. I actually wanted to return to some of your comments on uh, measuring different kinds of environmental impact and measuring different kinds of environmental benefit. Sure. Are there any categories that you feel right now are, um, I guess, particularly harmonious? The um, stakeholders agree that this is how the impact should be measured. Uh, 
we know how to measure it, and the measurement is accurate. Any categories which you think are uh, completely in discord, basically no one can agree how to measure it, we can't measure it, or we don't have the accuracy? Huh. Um, well, I think the, the emission reduction technologies, tend there, there's more agreement on. Um, so reducing nitrous oxide, reducing methane emissions. I think carbon sequestration lends in a, 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 a several levels of complexity because you're actually storing the carbon in the soil or in trees and you have to deal with the fact that it's going to stay stored. And in some cases you're changing land use as well and so you're altering production. And so you have all of these sort of terms that get widely thrown around in, in the carbon market space of additionality and leakage and permanence and uh, uncertainty and, and they all relate to various concerns that, that people have that the reductions that you achieve for, from offsets are real. Um, in my view, the emission reduction opportunities are more easy to quantify in many cases and have fewer issues with regard to permanence and leakage. Um, I think we are doing a, a pretty good job of quantifying water quality benefits and in fact, the tools that USDA has developed for assessing water quality improvements are already being used in markets in the Chesapeake Bay, in the Pacific Northwest, and are going to be ad adopted in regions like the Ohio River Basin as well. And so there's, you know, there are cases where we're actually creating not just pilots but real markets using these technology, these techniques. Okay. More organic content to the soil. <laughs> yeah, no, that's. Uh, um, in fact, NRCS, our, our Natural Resources Conservation Service, is going to be launching a national soil health initiative um, because it, you know, not only are there climate adaptation benefits from enhancing soil health, there are mitigation benefits for ex expanding soil organic matter and soil carbon. There are nutrient benefits, there are produc productivity benefits, there are reductions in, in runoff. And so the practices that can enhance soil carbon and soil organic matter, the use of cover crops, use of conservation tillage, um, organic amendments, now these are really critical practices to help farmers be more resilient to climate change and also can help um, effectively reduce emissions by storing carbon. That's a good place to end it. You know, yeah, no,